Right, we're going to move on to our next speaker today, um, and that is Dr. Paris Stefanoudis. Um, Paris is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford with Necton, and he is a marine ecologist and focus on conducting biodiversity and community assessments in shallow and deeper reef ecosystems using underwater video data. So it follows on nicely from Nico's. Um, Paris is going to talk about the deeper reef ecosystems in the Indian Ocean. Okay, Paris, I'm gonna hand over to you now. Thanks for the introduction, April. Hello to everyone, really nice to be here. Just gonna try and share my screen. I think I did it. Can you confirm? Yeah, confirmed. Okay, full screen mode. So yes, um, following from Nico's talk, um, he sort of discussed a little bit of the methodology that we followed to sort of analyze all of the video data that we have collected. And uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna sort of um, present you some of the main patterns that we found based on those image-based or video-based surveys. So briefly, uh, just for those that have joined us right now, during the 2019 First Ascent Seychelles expedition, we did the survey a total of seven sites um, spread out across, across six coral atolls. Uh, and we did survey specific depths, so 10 meters, 30, 60, 120, and 250, and occasionally at 350 meters. We had three replicate transect surveys per depth at each location, so overall it was just a little bit above 100 transect surveys that we have processed. Um, and the questions that we had, first of all, it was how does abundance, biomass and diversity of benthic and demersal fish communities change with depth and geography across Seychelles? The second question we had was if shallow and deeper reefs were connected, their communities, if there were, have been some sort of connectivity between them. And then the first, the third question was if reefs across the different locations that we have visited were actually similar or not. So before I sort of show you some of the results, first of all, some numbers in terms of, of, of the analysis itself. So in terms of number of species that we have observed during those video surveys, we did uh, identify 301 fish species. Um, and in terms of benthic morphotypes, more than 200, almost 200, 201. The reason again why we use the, this term morphotype as Nico explained is because using video-based surveys, in some cases, you might have to go to genus or family level. So because of that, you're actually not talking about species anymore. You're talking about morphologically similar specimens. So we term them as morphotypes. Now, some other numbers I'm going to throw at you in terms of fish depth extensions. That is, where did we find fish species actually occurring at deeper or shallower depths than what we already knew? Uh, in 45 cases, that has been the case. And we also had. Um, more than 40 new records specifically for the Seychelles. Uh, and in terms of the benthos, so all of the corals and sponges that live on the seafloor, it was a bit harder to determine how many new depth extensions or new records we have because information about distribution and depth range for benthic communities in general is a bit more sort of scattered around the literature. So there is no central database where you can very easily sort of check um, but there are a lot of talks this afternoon where a lot of the benthic taxonomists will provide you some more updates on that. In terms of new species, um, very sort of few bullet points. We think we potentially saw two new fish species. Of course, we did not collect any fish specimens to be able to verify, uh, but talking with various um, fish experts uh, from the Western Indian Ocean, uh, we are fairly confident that we at least have some sort of in situ images and video uh, from a new deep water basslet, as well as a mesophotic butterfly fish, which I'm going to show you later in one of the pictures as well. And for the benthos, I'm not going to say much other than that um, I'm encouraging you to see uh, Kava's talk, which is a couple of uh, talks after mine, and he's going to be talking about uh, new soft coral species. We do have a new species of brittle star uh, that is currently being described and uh, more or less 10 species of sponges. Um, during the video service, we did observe a lot of species, um, well, not a lot, we, we observed a couple of species of conservation concern, for example, 10 species of fish that have been described by IUCN as vulnerable, near threatened or endangered. And you can see on this plot here, uh, each block sort of um, indicates uh, 
presence of that uh, fish species in the different locations. And then the darker it is, it means the more common it was, the more sort of abundant it was in those locations. Uh, and you can see that you had species of conservation concern across all the visited um, coral reef atolls. Now, in terms of the metrics and the, the questions that I've sort of like uh, presented to you in the, in the beginning, how does density biomass and richness changes with depth? Uh, across all three metrics, you can see that there is um, this trend of decreasing density biomass and species richness as you go from the shallows to the deep. Now, for some of the metrics, this is more pronounced, for example, like in, in fish density and maybe less so for the species richness, but the trend was overall always there. Uh, and that did not also occur for fish, but it was also true for, for benthic communities as well. You also see again that, that density, which is like the abundance of organisms on the seafloor was decreasing as you went from the shallows at 10 meters all the way down to the deeper 250 meters. And the same was true also for the benthic um, species richness, although the patterns were a little bit more mixed there. Um, but still you had that sort of general decrease uh, in diversity with depth. Now we also looked at community composition uh, and that is the, the, the different species that made up a community and how that changed as you went from the shallows to the deep. Now, this is a PCA plot. Uh, and on a PCA plot, each circle represents uh, essentially the community composition of a given transect survey. So in order to understand this PCA plots, the more closely spaced two circles are, that means the more compositionally similar these two transects are. So we color coded them uh, based on the different depths that we surveyed them. And as you can see, there are sort of distinct groupings um, across depth. So you have distinct clusters at 10, 30, 60, 120, and then 250 and 350 are grouped together. And that has been the case even when we used fish counts. So that is the numbers of fish that we see, we saw at every uh, transect survey, but also when you use biomass, another very important sort of um, um, information when you collect um, um, information for fish services, how big actually those individuals are. And you can see that those patterns of distinct communities at depth persisted independent of which um, metric we used. Now, the skeptical of you might think, oh, there isn't necessarily sort of a clear distinction for some of the groups. And that might be true, but it's just sort of um, make you aware that a PCR plot, a principal coordinate and uh, ordination plot is a 2D representation of how communities are related with each other. Uh, we did also run a permanova uh, and actually all of this distinct sort of clusterings uh, were statistically significant. That's why we draw these circles around all of the different groupings. So distinct communities are there for the fish. And then when we used benthic community data, we had the same patterns as well. Again, the, circle, the dotted sort of circles around each of the groupings represent statistically significant results. And you can see um, that it did not change. Those patterns did not change, even when we used benthic counts or if we used presence and absence data. Now, the reason why we used presence and absence data in the occasion of benthic uh, communities is because some of the benthic morphotypes, such as encrusting sponges or encrusting algae, they're not very easy to necessarily count. Um, so it's, it's better to sort of go for a presence or absence and then run the analysis uh, using presence and absence data. But irrespective of that, you had the same sort of patterns um, as you went deeper. Now, what this means is that we have sort of distinct reef zones in Seychelles which reflects what is known from other parts of the world. At 10 meters is what we call the altiphotic or more commonly known the shallow reefs. At 30 meters, you have the beginning of the mesophotic zone. It's the upper mesophotic zone. Then at 60 meters, you have this transition from the upper to the low mesophotic zone. Some people call it the middle mesophotic zone as well. And then at 120 meters is that sort of boundary depth where you go from the low mesophotic to the upper rarephotic zone. Now, the reason why I'm using also the term rarephotic here is because one of uh, the ways you can sort of identify rarephotic communities, and that is based on the first description of the rarephotic zone from the Caribbean, is that you, have, you tend to have communities there which belong to families that are usually found in the shallow waters. So you might have distinct genera and species, but they all belong to families that are found in the, in the shallow waters as well. So they are sort of the deep water cousins of, of the mesophotic zone, if you like. Uh, 
uh, while when you go deeper, in this case at 250, 350 meters, uh, we call it a, a more typical uh, families that you would see there are usually restricted to the deep sea. And the deep sea is usually referred to as anything um, lower than 200 meters. Um, so at 250, 350, we have the, the upper Bathiel zone or, or, or the beginning of the aphotic zone. So you have those distinct zonations and that uh, similar sort of patterns have been described from the Caribbean, as I already mentioned, from Bermuda. Uh, and it's really uh, interesting to sort of be able to sort of um, um, present those patterns as well from Seychelles and the Western Indian Ocean. Now, just to give you an idea of how these sort of distinct communities that I keep uh, talking about uh, actually look like, at 10 meters, you can see you have an abundance of scleractinian corals. So these are the reef building sort of corals that provide that 3D complexity. Uh, and then you have a lot of uh, abundance of fish. Uh, zooplanktivorous schools of fish were really common in, in a lot of the um, locations that we have surveyed. Now, as you went deeper, the hard corals started to be proportionally less significant, but you then started having the appearance, if you like, of a lot of these big sea fans and other types of soft corals and sponges, which started to become increasingly more dominant. Um, and then at 60 meters, you almost lost completely all of the hard corals, and then all of the benthic communities were sort of dominated by sponges, uh, some type of encrusting algae. And of course, you had those soft corals, I think, on the, on the top um, right, you can see, for example, uh, whip corals started to appear and sort of become dominant. And then at 120, a completely different picture. As you can see, it was completely dark there. So you, you lost a lot of the light and that means you lost a lot of the photosynthetic, um, uh, photosynthetically uh, based organisms. Um, because of this, you had different communities. So of course you did see again, different types of soft corals, but these were different genera to what we observed. In, in the shallower reefs. And then you had a lot of uh, expanses of these um, whip corals, which were uh, really common in some locations. And then on the top right, that's one of the potentially new species of butterfly fish that I did mention before, when I was talking about new species. This has been sort of reported from, from the Comores as well. Um, so it's it's interesting to see um, if, if, you know, it would be nice to actually be able to to sample a specimen to be able to sort of verify that this is uh, a new species. And finally, between 250 and 350 meters is the so-called like the typical sort of deep sea habitats, very sort of moon-like sort of um, pictures here. You can see vast sort of expanses of bedrock overlaid by thin sediment layers. And then you have different types of um, benthic organisms that are usually found in, in the deep sea. Um, for example, you have a lot of sea urchins in Alphonse and uh, some deep water soft coral genera. Uh, fish density was very low, but you did see occasionally some sort of um, spectacular fish such as the ocean fish that you can see on the, on the bottom left. Now, of course, these were the biological patterns, and we're really interested to try and understand what is driving those biological patterns, which specific sort of environmental drivers are, are, are responsible for this. So we did collect a lot of water chemistry data during the expedition, such as temperature, salinity, oxygen. We did also collect a lot of substratum um, information and based for, for the image-based analysis, as Nick already said. So we did measure like, you know, the, the prevalence of bedrock boulders and so on in each of the images. And then we have a lot of topographic information for some of the work that Denise, Dennis, Denise did um, um, using multi um, bathymetry data from the expedition. And of course, this table is quite big. Uh, I don't want you necessarily to sort of focus on numbers here, but I did sort of highlight and bold all of the important environmental drivers for the fish and the benthic communities. And I think the takeaway message here is that you have a lot of drivers that are responsible for the patterns that we see in Seychelles. So it's not very clear cut to just sort of focus on one particular driver uh, and use that is usually an interplay between a lot of different drivers that are responsible for, for the patterns that we observe. And one of the things that we want to do over the next coming months with a lot of Seychellois and international collaborators is to kind of drill down to those particular sort of relationships between organisms that are of interest and try and see which particular um, environmental drivers are, are important for them. Now um, I'm getting close to the end of the presentation. I'm, I'm aware I'm close to finish. So um, in terms of trying and see patterns against 
location this time. So we're moving away from depth and we go to location. Uh, we did, uh, the, the patterns were less clear in this case. Um, for example, uh, depending on depth, you might have a double locations being different from Alphonse, or if you went a bit deeper, then the Roche might start it being a little bit different from Poivre and so forth. But overall, taking into account all these differences across depth at the different locations, uh, there seemed to be sort of three to four like distinct groupings. One of them was the Aldabra group. And I forgot to mention, this is using the fish data. Then you had Alphonse as you went a little bit towards the north. Then the Roche was less dissimilar from Poivre and St. Joseph. But again, it was sort of um, maybe one to two groupings there in the Amirants. Um, and if you went and looked at the benthic communities this time, so a lot of the corals and the sponges, then it was much more mixed than it was for the fish. So essentially what we found was that a lot of the depths, even between locations where sort of communities were sort of a little bit different with each other. Um, so I'm going to sort of summarize what that meant in my last slide. Um, so just to summarize in terms of how abundance biomass and diversity changed with depth, there was a general decrease with depth. So that was very clear. Uh, if shallow and deeper reefs in Seychelles were connected, now because we did see distinct communities with depth, it, it just sort of shows that not necessarily communities are not as connected as um, a lot of the le recent literature sort of has suggested. And this is important information. Uh, to consider if 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 you want to sort of conserve particular areas, is it, it sort of hints that you should also consider deeper reefs as well, and not necessarily focus on the shallow reefs because you have distinct things living as you go deeper. And then finally, if reefs are different across different locations, um, the patterns were more mixed. For benthos, it was much more greater differentiation compared to the fish. And this sort of suggests that if, if, if you're thinking about sort of managing a, a particular sort of uh, coral atoll, you should have sort of focus on, on exactly the specific characteristics that uh, uh, um, sort of characterize uh, that location. And finally, thanks to everyone. Um, I've just put here all of the different people involved um, that have been instrumental in being able to do this before, during, and after the expedition. So there were a lot of partners from Seychelles, international partners, and of course, international academic collaborators, and a lot of people from Nectum that of course have helped make this possible. So thanks to everyone. And if you have any questions, let me know. Just gonna stop sharing now. Thanks very much, Paris. That was super interesting. It's really nice to see you bringing together all these multidisciplinary data sets and starting to work with those. Um, we'll just have a look to see if there's any questions coming through. Um, whilst we wait for some questions, um, what, what's your indication or what's your idea about what's the biggest driver to that um, differences in biodiversity and I mean, obviously, depth is sort of like the defining driver, um, but of course, a lot of variables sort of change with depth. So temperature is another one that does, uh, of course, like um, determine what sort of communities you have as you go deeper. And then, of course, a substratum actually is, is really important, too. So if, if, if you lack uh, bedrock as you go deeper, then you won't have a lot of the corals or a lot of the sponges that actually need the substratum to be able to, to grow there. Uh, so I think these two are sort of the most important ones, but then of course topography, we just sort of started scratching on, on see which, which metrics are important and, and we plan on sort of focusing on that a little bit more in the, in the coming months. Great. Um, and also, was there anything other than those um, butterfly fish that were really unexpected for you? I think it, because, as I said, like there wasn't necessarily sort of lots of new species otherwise, um, uh, but there were a lot of species that you didn't expect necessarily to see them that deep. So that sort of increases a lot of the depth distribution for those species, which is really important. The habitat that they actually occupy is much bigger than we previously thought, which is important in itself. Um, uh, and then, of course, apart from this, those two sort of peculiar looking uh, species that we think are new, I think more or less you saw general that you expected to see there, but it was uh, the amount of them and um, the depth that they occurred. Okay, and there's a question that's come in. Um, it's fascinating to see um, from the screenshots that you showed um, and how similar are the overall community appearance is in the Seychelles and the Bahamas. Um, oh, because you worked there previously. 
Is that right? Um, we were in Bermuda last time, not not in, in the Bahamas. So I think, yes, I understand what uh, what the what the overall sort of question is. If if you look at the images themselves, you do see the same sort of communities in terms of not necessarily the same gender. Obviously, these are very different because you're at very different locations. But this sort of shows that. Uh, even at very sort of remote locations, such as Bermuda and Seychelles, as you go deeper, you have the same drivers again in play, and these sort of define uh, what, what communities you can find there. So obviously, yes, at 120 and at 150 meters, we did see similar communities in Bermuda and, 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 the, and the Indian Ocean, but the genera were obviously very, very different. But you have the similar adaptations of organisms living in those waters. So yes, they look similar if you see them. Okay, and as we are pretty short on time, I'm going to say one more question. Um, do you think that the island age might play a role in the communities? Hmm, I haven't really thought about that, I have to admit. Um, the island age. Otherwise Obviously, can... yeah, I think I have to sort of look it up and, and, and give more information to whoever asked that question. That's okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask you another quick one. Um, yes. If this survey had been conducted, say, 10 or 20 years ago, could we see any major differences today? I would have expected with, uh, with climate change and sort of, um, we know that there have been mass bleaching events happening in Seychelles over the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, obviously, communities, especially Bentham communities, I would expect them to be very different. And there's already sort of papers out there from, from Aldabra and other locations, Seychelles, that indicate that pre-bleaching events, of course, you had like much richer benthic communities. So one of the things that we're going to try and do with a lot of people um, working with Seychelles and, and, you know, with you as well, April, is to sort of try and compare the data that we collected in 2019 with historic data and try and see that those shifts and try and quantify if there is any change. Yeah, it's really exciting to see all this data and, and obviously there's a lot still to do. So, um, mm -hmm. It will be exciting to see what comes out over the next year or so with all the collaborations, because I can see you have a lot of collaborators there as well. Yeah, that's the only way. Exactly. Thank you very much, Paris. Thank you.